Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 75 of the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. Welcome aboard. Listen, before we begin today, um, I, I made an announcement in my Instagram Live while I was doing the 10,000 Swing Challenge because these questions kept coming up underneath, and it's, they drive me crazy. And there's basically about three or four areas. I, it just drives me crazy to answer these questions. Um, and so I'm not going to answer them anymore. Uh, so don't send them in. Um, uh, <laughs> the first is the Turkish getup. Uh, whenever I, as balanced as I can make an answer for Turkish getups, and I spend quality time trying to answer that question, the psychopaths come in and it's like, oh, you know, and there's all these questions. And, and, and in the questions, sometimes people do that humble brag stuff that drives me crazy. Well, you know, I'm using the blank kettlebell and <clears throat> listen, I've been to a bar where a drunk person laid on the ground, a woman got into his arm and he did a Turkish getup with a woman at a bar inebriated. That's impressive. It was also stupid. And so I'm not going to answer questions about the Turkish getup anymore. The Turkish getup is one of the best assessments I've ever used in my career. It's not... And if you want to showboat with it, that's fine. Uh, and go to the places online that love showboating for Turkish getups. I'm sure you'll find millions of sites online that discuss Turkish getups. The next one is the burpee. I'm not going to talk about the burpee anymore. Royal Burpee invented the burpee. <laughs> that's not great. Uh, I should have called the goblet squat the Dan John squat. The suitcase carry, the Dan John carry. I should have called the, uh, yeah, yeah, you get the point. The burpee is an assessment. Uh, Royal recommended four. And it's interesting because I've used the burpee as an assessment. And it's genius. You know, either start flat on your belly or in the push-up position plank. Uh, watch the person move themselves into a position to go vertical. Just that. Uh, if the person uh, does this bizarre uh, yoga pike and then brings the legs forward and can't, and they look stiff and slow, you can make assumptions about what's going on. I don't believe it as an exercise. And it's fine if you do. It's fine if you do. But I don't think it, it's, it's, it's a good way to train. Um, the third, of course, is lunges. Uh, as my good friend Pavel says, if you can do lunges, you shouldn't lunge. And if you can't do lunges, you shouldn't do lunges. Um, I just don't like lunges. I never have. Um, certainly, and, and you're gonna, someone's going to say, well, your good friend Mike Boyle loves them. I know. And if you go to his gym, he'll teach you really well how to do them. He'll show you great variations. Uh, but remember the, the kind of people we work with. Um, I, I'm just not going to answer questions about lunges. And you're going to ask me why I don't like them. And I just told you, but you won't, <laughs> not you, not you, but the other people will not listen. And the fourth one is, I'm not going to answer questions about Pavel's programs anymore. Pavel has a great forum at strongfirst.com. Ask him there. That's his forum. He can explain his programs better than I can. Um, I'm not being a jerk. It's just that, uh, and I've answered questions about Mark's programs, Mike Boyle's programs. Uh, boy, it, uh, Jim Wendler, I answer questions on constantly. I have no issues with that. But, uh, I just don't have the skill set to answer specific questions about programs I've never done and don't understand. So if I haven't done a program, I'm not going to comment on it. I only talk about, well, I mean, if you ask me about the Bulgarian weightlifting team's program, I didn't, well, actually I did, but uh, I'm not going to be able to make very good comments on it. So there you go. I'm not trying to be a jerk, but you know, I have a there's one overarching thing I don't like to talk about, and that's medical advice. I stay away from that as much as I can. I'm not comfortable with nutritional advice. Um, but when it comes to those particular things, I just want you to keep in mind, um, these are things that no matter what I say, the Turkish getup, the lunge, the burpee, um, Pavel's programs, no matter what I say, people are going to come in and argue to death about why my opinion is wrong. And why did you ask me the question if you don't want to hear my opinion? So I hope that helps. We have a question from Callum. Callum, good name. Is there value in one-arm push-ups done correctly if barbell exercises are too taxing on the shoulders 
while playing a weekly contact sport? You gotta love that question, you know? Uh, hey, my shoulder's so broken from doing this sport that I can't exercise right, so let's find exercises to fix it. That's part of the fun of being an athlete, is you're gonna get hurt. And then, here's the nice thing, Callum, and remember this years from now, you're getting yourself injured doing this sport. And people are gonna say years from now, um, hey, you must be stupid because you got injured doing this sport. And your answer should be, yeah, it's a very violent sport, whatever it is. Um, yeah, I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do. I mean, I'm not sure the one-arm push-up's magic or anything. It takes a lot of tension to do it correctly. Um, yeah, you're, I mean, obviously, you know, doing, uh, I like the one-arm kettlebell uh, bench press better uh, than one-arm push-ups as I can measure it. And I can, as your coach, I can see progression and regression. Um, but yeah, you can certainly do that. Uh, also, I know you talk about a 400 pound back squat as a good standard for performance. No, no. Uh, no. Um, Arthur Jones said a 400 pound squat's all you ever need. My good friend Dan Martin says a 400 pound squat's all you ever need. So smart people that I, you know, smart people that I trust, like Dan Martin, suggest that once you hit about that 400 pound mark, adding to it, you start to get into that cost to benefit issue. But let's, I should have stopped. Do you think between goblet squats and double kettlebell front squats, I could achieve this with only kettlebells, which range up to 70 pounds over a three to month, a four month period? So just doing double kettlebell front squats with, with 70s, 32s, 140 pounds. Well, I don't know if you get to 400 because you're talking about a specific test, but you would certainly, um, you'd certainly have some nice improvements. Um, I don't know why, I'm not sure why you need that magic 400 pounds. Uh, I mean, <laughs> if you're a, if you're like a semi-pro athlete right now, Callum, I don't know, or you're like a, a club player, when you hit the 400 pounds, is you know the professional team going to say, oh, you've you've squatted 400, let's give you five million dollars um, or five million pounds or whatever a year or whatever. Um, could you do it with kettlebells only? Yeah, if you've done it before, I think that would be fine. If you haven't, you need to learn how to squat 400. Um, if so, do you have any advice on an approach to take? My current one rep is with 363 pounds. Well, you're close enough. I mean, at 165, we're asking to add, you know, 20K to it. That's that's not very much. Um, <laughs> you know, um, you know <laughs> if, if we put a gun to your head, you'd probably be able to make that lift, you know. Uh, yeah, you... Since you've done 165, I, don't, I didn't see the lifts. I don't know how close it was, how deep it was. I don't know how smooth it was. But you certainly could maintain the 165, 363 without any issues. Uh, in, the problem with back squats, deadlifts, for most people, is that they're very specific and you need to train with the barbell. Boy, that's a lot. Boy, I gave you a, a lot of ifs, ands, or buts there. And I apologize, but it's you know, you're you're asking a, a difficult a difficult question uh, in a way. You're you're asking if you know, I'd like to see you instead have a double kettlebell front squ squat goal that's more appropriate to 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 what you need to do. Like you know, double kettlebell front squat. I don't know, uh, 25 reps with those double 32s. I mean, that would be an interesting goal. I mean, I tell you one thing, your your anaconda strength would be barking uh, in those last few reps. It'd be interesting to watch when you missed because the weight would slide off because your your area between your neck and your knees would have failed. Um, the column or the core, I hate the word core, but uh, uh, the, answer is, the answer is a certifiable, I don't know, um, I, I think I like the idea of doing goblet squats and double kettlebell front squats for a co contact sport athlete, um, but that number, that 400 pound squat, that 182.5 squat, uh, I don't know if you need it or not. That's my opinion. Thank you. Hey, good luck. We have a question from Aku. I'm a golfer currently in my off season. Golfers have an off season? What do you guys do when you want to take time off? What, go golfing? You know, uh, I will be finishing Easy Strength soon. After completing Easy Strength, there is four months until golf season. 
uh, until golf season begins. What would your suggestion on the type of exercise to do in that time? Should I train like a thrower? Um, yeah, I mean, I could see some value to throw it, like doing medicine ball throws. Uh, I could see some, uh, the whole family of them. Uh, go online, type in maybe medicine ball javelin throwers. Uh, I know the Finns have that wonderful one-page PDF with medicine balls for their javelin throwers that includes every exercise it, it, you could ever think of you could do with a medicine ball. Um, you know, I mean, the question is, I mean, do you want to snatch and clean and front squat? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that'd be kind of fun to see. Uh, many uh, throwers I know fall in love with long ball hitting after they retire because it it's a lot like throwing the discus, the, the shot, put the javelin, and maybe even the hammer. Um, when you say train like a thrower, I mean, I don't know if you need to get yourself up to, you know, 125 kilos, 275, and, you know, I, I don't know if that would help your game. You'd hit the ball farther. Um, should I train like a thrower? And then he says, how would you structure off-season training next year for a golfer? Um, the golfers and discus throwers have the same issues. We uh, become very asymmetrical, and that's good until you start to break. So one of the things I would have an off-season golfer do uh, would, would be probably to pick up a, a pair of, so if you're a right-handed, pick up a pair, of maybe just the driver, or maybe just something, maybe not even a driver, maybe, um, I don't know what it is, but uh, I don't know, golf, a wedge, a wedge, and spend some time in the off season with a target trying to, with the opposite side, try to practice your wedge and, you know, getting inside that, you know, I don't know, a garbage can or a bucket or something like that. Um, just, and don't take it too seriously, but practice uh, with the off side. Um, off season conditioning for golfers, uh, I would recommend what I've read from Phil Maffetone. I like his golf program. Yeah, he does. You do a set of squats for five, um, with a with a, a reasonable, repeatable load. Uh, you rest two or three minutes. You do deadlifts for five again, reasonable, repeatable load. Rest two three minutes. Do squats for five, uh, deadlifts for five. Focus on tension. Focus on perfect movement. Um, accumulate the squats and reps. Oh, you could probably do if you did uh, squat deadlift. Consider that one round. You know, at first, two rounds, and then build it up to three. Maybe uh, once every two or three weeks, do five rounds, and then, you know, fluctuate it. And uh, just, just work on getting uh, basically strong in the weight room. Uh, that's what I would do with a golfer. You don't need a lot of body mass, uh, and you don't want to waste a lot of your nervous energy uh, focusing and worrying on the big lifts. Um, from what I understand... Kettlebells can be very good with um, with golfing. Um, there is a book out there somewhere, Kettlebells for Golf. I don't need. It. There's a lot of windmills in there, but to me, that the windmill would be too technical. But if you did, if you did uh, swings and goblet squats, I mean, which is basically what I'm about to go do myself, that would probably be a pretty good off-season program. Having said that, you put a lot of stress on that lower back golfing uh not when you not when you're uh not when you have excellent technique but on those bad ones so you put stress on your on your bad strokes you, you put a lot of stress it's funny about the discus and the javelin uh, the javelin you can get hurt but you only get hurt when you have bad technique ask any javelin throw when they got hurt and it was like oh yeah i missed the throw and popped my shoulder out so if you have excellent golf technique I, you might be able to get a lot of swings in if you don't regress down, look up Bulgarian goat bag swings and do those instead. You know, I hope that helps. Um, certainly, I, uh, my knowledge of golf uh, is simply when I see it on TV, I, I press the button and go look for something else. But because of my work, I do bump into a lot of this kind of thing. Back when I sold my soul for a, a very famous company, uh, I had to deal with golfers. And um, they're a different breed of cat, you know. Um, but one thing they do have is an amazing work ethic, and uh, your questions remind me of, of that. All right, I hope that helps. Jeff has a question. You mentioned that for throwers or runners, you could recommend the deadlift. 
yeah, I don't, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, and I'm not all alone on that. I mean, as literally any coach worthy of their money would say that. Uh, and for runners, I, that goes back to the great tradition of Percy Sarity. I also remember one of your famous stories of how you won a powerlifting meet with the deadlift after rarely doing the deadlift leading up to it. Yeah, that's kind of cool, yeah. Uh, in the dead, is the deadlift something you think throwers should do in conjunction with the Olympic lifts as well as combat athletes to help performance? Or do you see the, F, the deadlift as an exercise that is lower down on the list of exercises in risk reward? <clears throat> well, you know, uh, Jeff, uh, if you're snatching and cleaning, why do you need a deadlift? I mean, you know, I, that's, that's, that's what I can, when I went to that powerlifting meet, don't forget, I was, I was snatching around 300. My goal, my goal for that meet was to snatch 300 and clean and jerk. I think it was 385 um, because there was an issue with the plates. Um, I, I didn't, but two weeks before the, that Olympic lifting meet where my goal was 300 and 385, I, I pulled 628 with no training. But come on now, I was snatching and cleaning and jerking. So if you have throwers and you can start them off early, uh, yeah, I think I think the snatch and clean and clean are, are where you want to play. My good friend Pizza Steve, a great collegiate shot putter, made a. It's like one of those things he said to me. He never did a snatch or a clean because as a shot putter, he was always worried about his wrist health, and he had hurt his wrist I think in high school. So he only did snatch high pulls and clean high pulls. And when he first told me that, I'm like, you know, that's... But then, you know, <laughs> after further investigation, I realized that he probably was a lot more right than I was. Uh, I did spend time in my career uh, just doing snatch and clean pulls. But for me, it wasn't very satisfying. Uh, looking back, that was not only my ego, but my... Uh, my kind of lack of self-discipline to to look at a good insight and ignore it. Uh, of course, I've learned so much since then. Um, the, the downside of, of deadlifts for throwers, we're always going to try to win the gym. And it's great to win the gym, except when winning the gym costs you uh, points on the field. Uh, too many times in my career... I've seen guys fall in love, throwers fall in love with the power lifts because they generally throwers can outlift most athletes in their sport. You know, we're big engines, a uh, lot of fast twitch. Uh, I don't know if it's DNA or selection. So I've watched my own athletes, you know, give away conference championships by winning the gym and the bench press contest the day before the, the conference, uh, getting hurt, doing stupid stuff. Uh, boy, that's... So yeah, so I would, I would include the deadlift, you know, in a, in an athlete's career, thrower athlete's career, obviously, but uh, with as many, uh, I don't know, I'd put some limits on it somehow. Okay, I, I hope that helps. Thanks so much. We have a question from Jamie. At the end of November, I came down with the COVID. Well, bless you. And I'm sorry to hear that. I have a lot of friends and family members get it, and it's brutal. It was quite bad and scary for me. I was very sick and worsening for a week at home and eventually went to the hospital and was there for nine days. Damn. Uh, I've been out almost a month now, and as you can imagine, it's taken a toll on my body. Week one was just getting down the street. Week two, my own shopping and some appointments. Week three, walking regularly, intentionally and for errands, trying to get out in fresh air as much as possible. And now week four, have started original strength, unlock your body, to help me reset on posture and mobility. Boy, this is good. This is very, this, I'm impressed. Um, uh, my nephew has it, and he's still struggling. Uh, and add some hypertrophy for my spirit, mind, and physically. Oh, he says physicality, I'm sorry. I hate that word, physicality. I hate it. I watch college football, and they use that word every other sentence, and it's like, is that really a word? Uh, I miss strength training. I'm thankful I put on that, uh, that I put so much consistency into my training through the summer and fall as I think it helped me fight off COVID. And it did, I hope. Uh, but my question is, for someone coming out of a serious case of COVID, do you have any advice or encouragement on how to move forward? Yeah, you're doing it. Um, I would say uh, the original uh, walking, there's your foundation. 
original strength, the rolls, the knocks, the, uh, the head movements. I like this. Um, when you can, I'd like you to get into uh, 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 grandma uh, uh, hypertrophy work. If you have the ability to go to machines, use machines, three sets of eight. The machines um, will allow you to build some hypertrophy, but the nice thing is you don't have to worry about balance. You have to worry about a lot of things. It'll take care of it for you. It'll take care of your anaconda strength. Uh, you don't necessarily want to be doing bottoms up half kneeling presses, which take a ton of nervous energy to fight and control. You, you kind of want it, but if you don't have access to, to a gym, uh, do as much two hand stuff as you can. Uh, really, with the one woman I'm working with who's recovering from COVID, we're just doing a double overhead press and goblet squat and nothing fancy. Uh, Boy, a couple sets of both, you know, we're looking at two to five sets of five to eight reps, not 10, 12, five to eight. Whew, rest, if you feel good after that, go for a walk. What I want you to do, if you don't mind, I want you to come back to me uh, after a few weeks of that, and then let's talk again. Uh, get back to me, okay? Uh, uh, be sure you make a note to Brian. Uh, Brian gets the podcast uh, podcast at danjohnuniversity.com emails and then he sends them to me and just make a note that uh, you know uh, dan asked to send this in and i'll either uh, we can either talk on email or maybe i'll share what i said to you uh, i would i'll do that i'll talk to you first on email and then i'll share uh, what we talked about here uh, covid is bad it's bad and if you got it gentle listener it didn't bother you well good for you okay uh you know, during the Vietnam War, uh, my family got ravaged by the war. Ravaged. And you might be staying around a 73-year-old who said, yeah, well, Vietnam was terrible for me. I smoked dope and practiced free love in a park. That's not nearly as bad. And, and protested. That's not nearly what I screw up with. So sometimes, folks, in life, some things hit some people harder than others. So let's have some respect for uh, our... our our gentle listener here, and, and uh, do your best to support people coming through this. Thank you. We have a question from Preston. I have completed two cycles of easy strength. For the first cycle, I used bench press as my, as my pushing movement, and at the end of 40 days, I reached my goal of bench pressing my body weight 15 times 185 pounds. You know what's weird, Preston, is that... Uh, I don't think I've ever recommended easy strength to do uh, the body weight for 15, but you made an interesting insight that Barry Ross came up with too. If your max goes up, your reps, uh, your rep maxes go up at the same time. Um, this is how I would train somebody for the combine bench press. Um, for the second cycle, I used a one arm overhead press with kettlebells. I gained strength in my overhead press, but after completing the 40 days, I tested my bench press and struggled to do five reps at my body weight. <clears throat> I, Preston, I, I think I need to fly out and hit you with a stick um, in a gentle, loving way. Do you know anything about the word specificity? <laughs> you didn't bench for eight weeks and then you tested your bench. Well, of course your, your reps are going to go down because you haven't practiced it. You know, uh, I quit playing the guitar for, let's see, I've quit playing the guitar now for 55 years when I pick up the guitar I'm not nearly as good as I used to be wow boy of course uh, especially there's certain exercises I think have the most specificity and I'm gonna be honest with you I think it's the squat family and the bench press and, and I have to say that the press family because it's true with the overhead too you know I could not deadlift for literally years and my deadlift doesn't go back I didn't deadlift heavy from 19, so I deadlifted right after my mom died, uh, and I deadlifted 628, and that was 1980. The next time I deadlifted heavy was in 2008 for a fundraiser put on my, for my daughter, for our good friend Larry, who's just died of COVID, by the way, God bless his soul. So 1980, 20, so I took off deadlifting for 28 years, and I pulled 600 with no training. 
uh, your mileage may vary, but the deadlift doesn't go. Uh, it might take you one swing workout to get back in the groove of swings. Uh, the pull-up goes faster. There you go. The hypertrophy training movements, push, pull, and squat. Those three, tend, you tend to lose the most in reps and, 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 and load. Hinges and loaded carries, you don't seem to. With loaded carries, you lose the anaconda strength, so you'll pay a high price the next day with, ooh, what is that muscle? So um, yeah, it's just specificity. He goes on for the question. My goal is to maintain a 15 rep body weight bench press while working toward a body weight overhead press like the strength standard uh, described in Sleepless in Seattle article. Do you have any advice on how to do this? Yeah, you're going to have to do, uh, you're going to have to train like a 1960s weightlifter. Uh, you're going to have to press, uh, overhead press, um, and you're going to have to bench press. Uh, if you're going to do the easy strength training, now, see, here's the thing. Easy strength uh, gets you up to a certain level of strength with the WTF effect, the what-the-heck effect. And then you, yeah, yay for me, I'm stronger. But you're doing something with sports specificity. You know, when, when we use the Southwood program, which is the bench press, uh, power clean, military, front squat, and bench press, we were able to chase uh, those two presses because we're doing them daily. You might have to do them uh, uh, up to three times a week each. Uh, you could probably get away with just benching twice a week, but with the military, it's going to have to be three times. So there you go. I mean, if you're going to do easy strength with it, you're going to bench twice a week, and the other three days you're going to military. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm uh, Preston. I've, I don't know. I've never done this myself. I mean, I've obviously military and bench presses and programs, but uh, you're, you're going into some uncharted waters. But you're going to have to chase. You're, you're chasing two rabbits. But the nice thing about the rabbits that you're chasing is that they're they're both looking for the same hole. So. You got a chance to make this goal. Good luck on this. Matt asks a question. It's kind of fun to see this same question, kind of question show up. Working off your sleepless in Seattle metrics, I can do all of them with the exception of the overhead squat. Yeah, because that's really, really tough. Uh, 15 reps at a body weight is so far out of my reach at this point. And hats off to uh, uh, Mark Carter for giving me that number back. On May 21st, 1988, that's when he told me uh, 15 reps in the overhead squat. I tried your recommendation of using a PVC pipe and kettlebell to get in and out of position. I feel like I have good hip flexibility. My goblet squat is deep. I have no issues pistol squatting. Uh, pistol squat is almost DNA. It's, it's, it's good for you, but it, most I've had people do massive pistol squats, heavy pistol squats, the first time they ever saw it. And I've had really elite athletes never be able to do it. Um, and hip flexibility is very important for rock climbing, being able to get your hips over your feet. So it is something that is important in my training. Where I feel the issue is in my T-spine and lack of scapular movement, whatever that means. Would you suggest, what would you suggest as far as improving my T-spine mobility? Well, if you look at my video on YouTube, um, you know, one thing you might want to think about is adding the hangs but the problem with being a rock climber, and don't take this wrong, but you guys are golems, man. You know, you're, you're all bunched up like this. Um, you're, you might get this goal of overhead squatting your body weight for 15 and hurting your rock climbing. Uh, you know, it's going to be one of those things where uh, it's a cliche, and I just used it a minute ago, but uh, the two rabbits you're chasing might actually get in the way of each other. I don't know why you think you need this uh this goal of the overhead squat for 15. Um, I mean, it, if it's a personal thing, then do it. But I, I just have to caution you that sometimes chasing a strength thing in the weight room can hurt your performance over here. And that's just something you want to do. Um, I was going to tell you to hang more, but rock climbing has a different kind of hanging than what we do for shoulder mobility for Olympic lifting. Um, uh, it's something you're going to have to think about. Personally, if if you want if you want to chase the rock climbing, uh, you're you're fine. Uh, but if it's something important to you, then find yourself an Olympic lifting coach. Start snatching and 
Uh, and the snatch is going to help you get in that position and then the overhead squats are just going to become uh, kind of what you do. Uh, at the end of that goal, you might wake up and say, now, now why did I do this? Uh, I want you to think about that and then get back to me, okay? Thank you. We have a question from Jill that sneaks right up on medical advice, but I'll, I'll do what I can. Lately, I've been experiencing an increase of popping in my finger and shoulder joints. It most often occurs when I'm twisting the lid off of a jar or unloading and loading grocery bags. It isn't always painful, but I do notice some discomfort more and more. I am 51 years old and I've been lifting since I was 14. Jill's been lifting since she's 14. That is very cool. Uh, I played competitive sports, mostly soccer. Oh, I thought you said sports. <laughs> along with volleyball, basketball, and track from about eight years old until 35 when the sprains and strains were occurring faster than I was healing. Because of hereditary knee issues, lifting and walking are absolutely necessary to avoid debilitating back spasms, besides the fact she enjoys lifting. I've been on the park bench program since you launched it and feel fantastic. No aches, no pains, except for this popping thing. I am getting, getting good grip work in with the kettlebell dumbbell carries using 50 pound dumbbells for the carries and general barbell work. First off, Jill, thank you. Uh, it's nice to have a 51 year old woman using 50 pound uh, bells to do their carries and I have a hard time telling some of the men to go over 35 pounds. Um, I will use your example many times in the upcoming future. That's redundant, isn't it? Upcoming future versus the other guy. Um, it seems that I need to work in some joint care, an area of health that I'm unfamiliar with. What would you suggest I start? I would start here. I would go to a doctor. Um, I'm worried that, and you're 51, but if there's any kind of uh, arthritis in your family or anything like that, uh, a short visit with a doctor, show him your concerns. Now he might just simply, uh, he or she might simply say, uh, hey Jill, you know, you're 51. Or it might be some simple thing, or it might be, you know, literally nothing at all, and we can work with it. But I do want that medical clearance. Um, also, I was never one to be popping my fingers as a kid. My daughter, Lindsay, pops her fingers constantly, and it drives me effing crazy. My mom thought it was rude to crack her knuckles, so I try to tell my daughter not to crack her knuckles, and I swear she does it to drive me crazy. And by the way, She's almost got me to crazy town. Uh, if my dad heard my bro brother I do that, we got a timeout that include squeezing a tennis ball. I like your dad. Uh, I am not lifting as heavy as in my younger years, yeah. Uh, yet still pushing hard and putting up with some decent numbers. In the spirit of longevity, how do I keep my joint health in line with my strength? Well, <clears throat> if you're on the site, and it sounds like you are, be sure to read the work of Tim Anderson and Original Strength, his pressing reset. Uh, a couple of quick things. I, okay, so A, medical intervention. I want you to see a doctor. Two, Tim Anderson's joint mobility work that's called Original Strength. The nods and the, and the look for my shoes and all that stuff. The next thing I want you to start thinking about is I coach the hands and the feet as being, being mini trampolines, okay? Um, when you do stuff, when you put your hands on the ground from, from now on and you do an exercise, I want you to think of the hands as a mini tramp. Boom, boom, boom. Um, that might help. And then, so, in medical intervention, original strength, rethinking your hands and feet as mini trampolines, working on the bounce. Um, that's why I think, I'm not, I don't jump rope myself, I do similar exercises. You know why I don't jump rope? Uh, I can't. I'm not very good at it, and I don't like to do things I'm not good at. There's my ego. Um, I do those side-to-side -side soft bounces. Uh, I, 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 I kind of bounce around. When I put my hands on the ground, I try to be bouncy. Uh, try those two things also, uh, the bouncy stuff on the ground. See a doctor. Get cleared. Boy, maybe even an x-ray might help. Uh, I don't know. Uh, original strength. Take that really seriously. Think bounces with your hands and feet, and then I want you to stay in touch with me because I want to. I want to find out what you find out. Okay, 
boy, I hope that helps. Thank you so much. Well, there you go. Uh, that's another episode. Remember, if you have questions, email them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one, but you know, you know, there's certain questions I won't answer. So thank you.